Hello? Hello, hello. Hello, hello. 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 Good morning. Or not. <laughs> it, hey, there we go. Good morning, King's Trail. All right. Well, we want to welcome everybody here this morning. Uh, it's, uh, how many of y'all are first time visitors today? Amen. Well, welcome to King's Trail for the first time. We appreciate y'all being here. We're honored to have y'all here this morning. Um, but come back next week because you'll get to see Jason Norton, our senior pastor, next week. Uh, today we have a special guest for y'all. Uh, he's a real good friend of mine and a brother in Christ. His name is Mondo Davis. We met him, I met him, I don't know, four or five, four or five months ago um, through an organization that we're part of called Rise Up Kings. Um, he was a, he's a head coach with them. Uh, here, I'm going to mess this up, so I'm just going to read read it. If my phone will cooperate this service, it didn't want to cooperate last service. Still not, there we go. All right, here we go. Mondo Davis is a pastor, a speaker, an author, and entrepreneur. He is passionate about helping people discover their purpose and fulfill their God-given destiny. He believes the world would be a better place if every one of us got into an alignment with our God-given assignment. Amen? When Mondo was 16 years old, he attended a youth Bible study in Newport News, Virginia, where his eyes were open to the desperate need for a Savior. He realized God had a bigger plan for his life, and he desires for everyone to discover that plan for themselves. Mondo was a professional football player in the NFL with the New York Jets and wellness consultant before entering into full-time ministry. He holds bachelor degrees and master's degrees. He attended Rima Bible College and graduated with a concentration in pastoral studies. Um, unfortunately, uh, his family was able to join him for first service, but they were not able to be here for second service. He was supposed to come about two months ago uh, on, I think it was June 30th, and his wife was pregnant. And he said, hey, if I'm not, if I, when we set it up, he said, if I'm not able to make it, it's because she went into labor. Well, it was about 7.30, 8 o'clock on Saturday night. And he called me, FaceTimed me. And I'm like, well, that's weird. Mondo doesn't ever FaceTime. He just usually calls or texts. So I answered the FaceTime, and I got to see, uh, his, for the first time, his beautiful baby daughter, his 11th child. <laughs> So they literally took the entire front row for a service. You can come on up, brother. The entire front row was nothing but his family to service, so, uh, but they headed back to, to worship with their church family at their home church for their service. And so I want to welcome Mr. Mondo Davis. One, two, three. Jesus! Ah. I love King's Trail. That is absolutely amazing. I could not wait to do that. Man, y'all look amazing. And I am so honored to be here with you this morning. Take a moment and let's just honor the Lord because his presence is right here, right now, available for you. Let's give the King of Kings praise. And I want to take a moment right now to honor Pastor Jason and Molly. Thank you. I was pleasantly surprised by the massive stature of your pastor. <laughs> I just kept looking up and up and up. I was like, okay. And one of the things that I immediately noticed was that although he is a very large man in the natural, he's even bigger in the spirit realm. You all are blessed, and God has given you a gift in the Norton family. Can we please give honor where honor is due for your pastor? <laughs> and Pastor Dwayne and his lovely wife, Brandy, he is a man of true humility, and I have so enjoyed our friendship over the last few months as we've gotten to know one another. One of the things we do, we do, uh, we do ice baths, and we get in the hot sauna. 
And we've had a lot of great conversations about all that God is doing in those moments. So I'm so grateful for you, your precious family. I got a chance to meet your children today. Beautiful family. Thank you. And then and the, and the vessels. My brother came through and your lovely wife. You, you are a beautiful, beautiful couple. And you actually inspire me. You inspire me. So thank you for the way that you live out true faith. King's Trail, God has set you up because you are not followers, you are leaders, and God is destined for you to blaze a new trail. Anybody receive that today? I'm, I'm telling you, like, you don't have to be concerned. I love it when you talk back to me. So we're going to have some fun. Are y'all ready? All right. Father, we welcome your presence. We thank you for the word that's going to come forth. I yield myself to you as a ready vessel. Use me as you see fit to bring forth any and everything necessary for every single person to leave here different than the way that they came. And in the end, we promise to give you all the praise, honor, and glory. And all of God's children said, amen. amen. Awesome. So I want to share with you that, yes, my family did take up this entire row. I felt bad for anybody looking for a seat. Can't sit in the front. They, uh, my wife sends her love, and I do thank you for your grace, as I was supposed to be here a couple of months ago. And uh, as Pastor Dwayne said, we were pleasantly surprised with a new gift to our family. And I'll share a little bit more about that throughout the message. And I know many of you are thinking, man, why should I listen to this guy? What does he have to say to me? Why? I promise you, I'll weave in some of the key moments of my life and the things that God has brought me through uh, to lay down some rapport with you. And my hope is that you'll be able to see maybe a glimpse of how God wants to show up in your life through how he's shown up in mine. And somebody that we probably all know, if you've been saved more than, more than five minutes in the Bible, a man by the name of Joseph. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to weave a principle on top of Joseph's life and show you how God showed up for him. And my hope is that the Holy Spirit will reveal that no matter what you're going through, no matter what your experience in life is right now, whether on a mountaintop or in a valley, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he is no respecter of person. Is there anybody that believes that this morning? If you're watching online, is there a camera somewhere for those online? Can I point somewhere? Right back there. If you're watching online, God's got something for you. So tune in. Be present because I believe the Holy Spirit wants to touch you right where you are. King's Trail, are y'all ready? Yeah. I can't hear you. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Take a moment. I want you to close your eyes. We're not going to do anything weird. We're not going to sprinkle any gold dust or anything like that. Just, just take a moment. Just, just close your eyes. I just want you to eliminate the distractions just for a moment. And I want you to just think for a moment and imagine that you're standing on a mountaintop. Imagine just like that beautiful sunrise we saw this morning. You can see that thing just peeking right above the crest. And as you look and you see that beautiful sun, I want you to imagine that you're wearing a hat. It be the hat you have on right now, all these amazing cowboy hats. But for the sake of this illustration, it's going to be a visor. Now, what is the purpose of the visor. With your eyes closed, you can shout it out. What's the purpose of a hat, a visor? What does it do for you? Yeah, yes. It, it does a lot of things, but in this context, it's going to block out the thing that's preventing you from being able to see clearly. It's going to eliminate distractions to give you clarity. And throughout the entire process of this message, we're going to use this illustration. Now, as you are looking, imagine that you're looking from the top of this mountain, and you see the next mountaintop, whatever that thing is, whatever it represents in your life, it could be reconciling a relationship, it could be you having the prodigal come back home, it could be you receiving healing from that doctor's report that you received, it could be you writing the book, starting the business, starting the ministry, it could be you getting married or having a child. Whatever the dream is, whatever the vision is that God's put in your heart, I want you to imagine that this next mountaintop is that thing. You got it? If you got it, let me hear you say yes. yes. Absolutely. So when you think about this, now you can open your eyes. I'm going to have you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, and then, if you like, you can put a marker in Genesis 37. 
So we're going to start off with a foundational scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, and then we're going to camp out for the rest of the message in Genesis, starting at chapter 37. I love it. I love hearing those pages turn. Woo. So in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, it says, understand, therefore, anytime you see the word therefore, you should always take a moment to ask what is therefore. That the Lord, your God, is indeed God. In other words, just in case you forgot or just in case there's a question or just in case you're going through a hardship and you're like, man, where is God at right now in my life? He, he goes on to say, he is faithful. Somebody say faithful. faithful. He's a faithful God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commands. So now, I got a question for you. This question changed my life, and it is, Dr. Cindy Trim, could things be the way they are because of the way that you are? What is the one thing that you can change that will change everything? Mm-hmm, y'all are a smart group. If you will change, everything will change for you. So, how many of you have ever gotten a vision from God? Let me hear you say yes if you have. Yes. Okay? And then you get excited, and you're like, oh, we're right here. We're ready to rock and roll. What's the fastest way to get from point A to point B? Straight line. Y'all are so sharp. Look at this. It's just absolutely beautiful, right? But what happens when God gives you that vision and you go to take a step of faith in that direction? What happens? The line gets all what? Gets all squiggly. Or am I the only one? Like, come on, Lord, really? You just told me to do this thing and now everything's blowing up. We got any honest people in church this morning, right? The line gets all squiggly and it's like, how in the world did I end up over here? And then somehow, some way, we kind of crossed the finish line. Am I the only one? Is that kind of how it looks for your life sometimes? Right? So, so we get this vision. Can y'all see over here? Let me hear you say yes if you can see it. Okay. So is it okay to stay right here? Let's move it. We said I got to know. All right. Can everyone see the, the whiteboard? Now you can't see it. We can't win. All right. Move the podium. It's on wheels? Okay. Now y'all can't see. <laughs> I'm going to move it just like this, and then I'll come back and just reference my notes. How's that? Is that better? Yeah. All right. We figured it out. Okay. So here's what happens in life. Sometimes we get stuck in these paradigms, and we get stuck in these constructs, these thought processes, these limiting beliefs. And we get to a point where we, we begin to lose hope. The hopeful become hopeless, right? Because you're like, man, I thought God had me. I, got, I gave my life to Christ, and everything just kind of blew up in my world. Or the faithful become faithless because it's like, man, I'm not seeing how this thing is working out. So I liken you to consider a different school of thought to maybe see this from a different perspective. Are you willing? Okay. So I see it as a... Cycle. Everybody say cycle. Because with God, it's an open book test. You just keep taking it until you pass. That's good news for a lot of us like me, right? I wasn't the sharpest tool in the box, but I tell you what, God is faithful. We just learned that in Deuteronomy 7, 9, didn't we? So when you think about it as a cycle, it keeps you so that your breakthrough is no longer the thing that could break you. So it all starts with vision. Someone say vision. vision. Vision is the key. Now, why is vision important? Because God had a vision when he placed you here on the earth. Like, since the beginning of time, God had you in his mind. Did you know that the word vision is a Hebrew word, kazon? Say it, say it. Okay, now we got to have more fun with it. We're going to do it like Hebrews. 
So you're going to... Don't look to the left or right. We are in church, and we don't want anybody laying hands. Keep your, keep your face forward. Try it again. There you go. Y'all are awesome. It's, it's literally to see the end. This way is for y'all. See the end from the beginning. In other words, God does not start something until he is already finished. Come on, y'all, that's good news for some of you. God would not have given you that thing unless he already knew you would accomplish it. So now you're like, well, what, what, is, what does success even mean? Like, is this, let's get on the same page. What, y'all talk to me this side. What is success? What is, what is success? Somebody throw out something. Accomplish your goals. Finish what you started right in the middle. <laughs> Pastor already knows the answer. We're not gonna, you're not allowed to answer. Pastor Dwayne, you're not allowed to answer. What is it? Grandchildren is success. I like that. That's good. What's, the, what's maybe a few other definitions of success? There's no right or wrong. I'm not trying to trick you here. What, what is success? Like happiness. happiness. What else? Let's say again. Health. Health. I love it. So it means different things to different people. You see this? Or there's no right or wrong. Okay, over here. I'm not going to leave y'all hanging. I love you on this side too. Love, security. What else is success? Obeying God. Obeying God. Boom. What's your name? Peggy. Peggy. Let's clap it up for Peggy. All of those answers were correct. And the reason being is because success is simply obeying God and fulfilling what he's called you to do with your life. And if in this season is receiving healing, then that is success. If it's having grandchildren because he put grandchildren in your heart, that is success. It is literally obeying God's command and fulfilling the vision he put in your heart. Somebody say vision. Vision. Chazon. Yeah, oh, y'all like that. One, two, three. Jesus! He's the one who gives the vision. He's the one that does it. And when you know him, Psalm 37, 4 says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. He's not Santa Claus. This is not about Christmas trees and ra- unwrapping gifts. He is the gift. So when you come in contact with him, He shows up, and you are delighting, which means to take pleasure or find pleasure in. Therefore, being so close to him in proximity, you now are in position where your desires become his desires, and his desires become your desires. So his promise is that when your desires become his desires, he's going to give you everything that you need. Amen? Amen? Amen. But it's got to start with God. It's got to start with Jesus. And I'm going to show you a story here. I'm going to read this. In regard to Joseph, because I want to show you biblically how this concept plays out. So, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 37, verse 5. And we're going to read through verse 11. Genesis chapter 37, verse 5. We're going to read through 11. And as I set this up, I want you to understand. Oh, sorry about that. That's the anointing, the anointing of God. No, it was actually me. I just bumped it. All right, I'll sit this right here. Is that okay? All right. So I want to set this up by saying when you think about the Israelites and the time that they spent in bondage, in slavery, just take a moment and think about your own family lineage. I'm going to give you this illustration to kind of put this thing in context. Think about your dad, your mom, his dad, his mom. His dad's dad, his mom's mom, his dad's dad's dad, his mom's mom's mom. All slaves. 400 years. All they know in the family tree and genealogy is slavery for 400 years. And then God makes a promise and says, I'm going to deliver you out of bondage and give you freedom by taking you to the promised land. And now you got generations that's all they know are now being set free. How many know how many days that journey was supposed to be in the wilderness to become free in the promised land? Okay, I heard quite a few. Some theologians believe it was anywhere from like 11 to 13, 14 days. The actual route to get to that point of freedom in the promised land. 
How many know 400 years of slavery bound up in the heart of God's people, and he took 40 years to unwind it in the wilderness. 400 years took 40 years to get unwind, unwound so they can step into God's promise in the land that he had for them. How many know we don't have to take that long? Amen. I got good news. Tell your neighbor, you don't have to wait that long. Your time is now. That's right. So whatever has been trying to hold you back, we can let it go. Today is your day. We're going to dig into this thing. So when you look at Joseph's life, Genesis chapter 37, verse 5, I want to read. Now, Joseph had a dream. In other words, he had a vision. Somebody say vision. vision. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. In other words, hear this vision, man. Hear this thing. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheep arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? It's like, imagine telling your brothers that or your, your family, right? I'm like, bro, who you think you are, bro? What? Come on, man. Are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams slash visions and for his words. And then, to add insult to injury, verse 9, he dreamed another dream. Guess who's excited to share that one, too? He told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, 11 stars are bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. So when we think about this, I got a couple of thoughts for you. Many theologians believe that he was around, he was around 17 years old or so. He was a teenager. How many know that, you know, those years aren't the, probably the best years? <laughs> At least when it comes to exercising some wisdom. <laughs> probably wasn't the smartest idea. Guess what, guys? All of y'all are bound down to me, man. Aren't you excited? <laughs> no. Right? So would you agree that it was probably, we can infer that there was probably a little bit of arrogance, maybe a little cockiness, lack of self-awareness. Some of those things can show up in the form of the word with three letters, ego. Yeah. So I heard, I heard this in between the last service, and I don't know if my brother's still here, but one of the, one of the guys came up to me and was like, man, I heard this, this quote around the word ego. It's an acronym, and it stands for edging God out. Mm, that's the same thing I did. I was like, oh, that's good. So I'm here today to tell you if there's any ego showing up for you, you are edging God out, and your ego is not your amigo. Amen. Leave it at the door. So he didn't get that lesson soon enough. Is there a possibility that you've gotten this vision from God and things are not necessarily going the way that you thought they should go? So for me, I had a vision to do something with my life after I realized my desperate need for a savior. So where are my teens at in here? Do we have any teens in this service? Show of hands. Yeah, I see you, I see you. That's our future world changers, y'all. Let's clap it up for our teens in here today. Let's go. That's right. Yes. So right around y'all's age, I was 16. I went to a youth Bible study in Newport News, Virginia. And when I showed up, I was there with both of my best friends. One was white, the other one was Hispanic. We had like all the colors covered, okay? <laughs> and they gave the altar call and, and I hugged one. I, I just gave him like a little headlock, like a loving, like, hey, bro, I love you, man. And then I hugged the other one, love you too, bro. And then as soon as he did the altar call, I squeezed just tight enough where they couldn't wiggle out. And I stood all three of us up and we all walked forward. And I was like, we're getting saved today, guys. <laughs> True story. We're still best friends to this day. I don't want to date myself, it was decades ago. But man, there was something that shifted in that moment, and I was so excited about my salvation that in my 16-year-old mind, I thought, man, the best thing I can do to glorify God and have the most impact to help people is, is make a goal to go to the NFL. So that, that started my journey, the vision that God allowed me to receive in my heart. And the purpose was so that on an NFL Sunday, after everybody's done watching the game, 
Hopefully, I can win enough games or maybe even go to the Super Bowl if I'm lucky and have just a few moments to tell everybody about Jesus. And man, that thing lit me up. And fast forward after losing. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> after losing an enormous amount of games. I'm talking about 0-30, y'all. Like, pray for your boy. We didn't win a game in three years. And I was like, there's no way this thing is going to come to pass. Lord, you're going to have to really come through. And then God shows up and wound up going to the University of Delaware on a full scholarship for football. Somehow, miraculously got a scholarship. And then we wound up winning a national championship. And then I met my beautiful bride. And I walk into a locker room. And I look over my shoulder, and there's a mirror, and I see my name, and I see the Jets logo on the side of my helmet. And I think, man, God, almost 10 years of blood, sweat, and tears, and you got me here. Training in the heat to the point where I see stars. Running so long that my legs and hamstrings will lock up with cramps to the point where I was curled in a ball on the side of the bed trying to rehydrate with electrolytes. Like, this type of dedication, but you get all the glory because you got me here, Lord. And I had this moment in the locker room. I was like, wow. And I was so excited. In our first game, we played against the Detroit Lions. We come out, beautiful, beautiful Sunday night. I'm waiting. I'm like a, I'm like a kid in a candy store. I'm like a lion in a cage. I'm like, oh, let me out of here. Third quarter comes, and man, they put me in, and they throw the ball to the running back. And I'm playing linebacker, outside linebacker, and I break out, and I start closing down on that running back, and it, the lights are on. So he looks up, and he gets blinded by the lights, and the ball hits him smack in the face. And the ball starts bouncing in the air, and guess who was right there to catch it? Yours truly. Boop. Thank you. We're going to the touchdown. Let's go. And man, I barely stepped out of bounds. My coach at the time gave me this big bear hug and said, I'm so proud of you. Good job. And next thing you know, he's like, Mondo, you're going to start on special teams next week. So when we play against the Vikings, I want you coming out for kickoff. And man, I'm excited. I'm like, this is it. God, you did it. We're going to go out here. We're going to glorify God with this platform. How many know? Sometimes our ideas are not always God's ideas. First play of the game, whistle's blown, ball's kicked. I remember the smell of the fresh cut grass, the raving fans, the lights beaming down, coming through that tunnel, and now we're running down the field. First one down has got a hit, what's called the wedge, okay? Your pastor's a loving man, but imagine three or four of him locked arms like this. And if you're the first one down, you got to be crazy enough to hit that thing right in the middle. And guess who was the first one down? Yours truly. Hit that wedge, boom, everything goes black. Next thing you know, I'm in the training room. They put me on one of those little golf carts. They're whispering. They're doing all these little tests. And then they finally come back and say, Mondo, we have good news and bad news. Which one do you want first? I say, give me the bad news. Bad news is you tore your ACL. You are done a minimum of 18 months. Your knee is banged up really bad. I said, well, what could possibly be good news after that? They said, the good news is we still want you to be a New York Jet. How many know that when you're at the bottom and God has given you a vision and you've taken a step and that line got squiggly and you feel like everything's going haywire in your life, everything's blowing up in your family, everything's failing in the finances, like you can't figure it out. It's in that moment when the enemy wants to come and put his foot right on your neck. And that's what I felt. He said, oh, that dream you had to go and glorify God, stand up in front of all the people around the nation and Testify to how good God is. Guess what? Your, your NFL dream means not for long. Man, I was flirting with depression. Felt like hopeless. I felt like, man, I'm, I'm worth nothing. I failed. And then in that moment, at my, at my darkest place, God stepped up and said, no, son, NFL for you doesn't mean not for long. That means newfound life. Now you're about to step into your true destiny to inspire leaders to be transformed and set free to fulfill their God-given destiny. That's what I made you to do, and I don't need the NFL to do it. All I need is a willing vessel. And there was another man who saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And after my three years were over playing professional football, he said, come with me, let me show you the way, because I see that call on your life. And a week later, I was on an airplane with that man, and we had traveled over 30 countries in just over 14 months being trained to teach and preach, to coach, consult, and help people step into their true destiny, to get into alignment for their assignment. Yes. Yeah. And God is no respecter of person. Right. So guess what? He has a vision 
for you, whether you believe it or not. Look at your neighbor and tell him, yeah, he's got something for you too. Tell him, left and right, he's got something for you. So when Joseph got this thing, how many know it blew up? Now, let me go to the scripture here. Genesis chapter 37, verse 23. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore. And they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty and there was no water in it. The enemy came and put his foot on Joseph's neck. Said, who do you think you are? Hmm? Get in that pit. The very people that were supposed to have his back Stabbed him in the back. My question is, have you ever experienced anything like that? Don't raise your hand. If you've been alive more than 24 hours, guarantee you, you've experienced some pain. All of us have. So it's in that pit where he had an idea of what he thought. But God had a different idea. How many know that a God idea is always better than a good idea? Even if we don't understand it. God didn't throw him in the pit, but God allowed it because there was a bigger purpose. So whatever your pit is, just think about it for a moment. It could be a broken relationship, financial challenges that you're going through right now, a vision unfulfilled, the death of a loved one a sickness, a diagnosis, a relationship, a prodigal child that still hasn't returned. Guarantee you everything I just said is present in this room right now. Behind all these beautiful faces, all of us have pain. So don't ever miss an opportunity because all of us are walking through something, myself included. So when God opens that door for you to be there for another human being, please lean into that. Because many of us are in pits right now. And we're trying to find our way. But God has, I believe, allowed this opportunity for me to be here to bring some encouragement to you. Because sometimes when we're following the navigation of that Bible, it can feel as if we get disoriented. And it's like, God, how did I end up in this spot and I've been serving you and doing the things you called me to do? I want to give you a different perspective today to understand that although it be painful, God is still right here with you in the midst of your circumstance. And he has a greater plan for you. How can I say that with so much confidence? Because Romans 8, 28 still holds to be true, that all things work together for the good of those who love Christ and are called according to his purpose. James chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you go through trials and tribulations of many kinds, because God is bringing steadfast maturity, strength to you, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Even when I felt like, God, I've worked for the last decade of my life to get here, and I just failed, God is like, son, I'm working out something bigger, something better. Because my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. I've got ideas that you can't even understand. But you got to trust me. And when you do, it's going to lead to the strategy. That I am going to execute Flawlessly. How many of y'all play chess? Anybody know? Okay. How many of y'all know that God is the ultimate chess player? Like, do you realize that your father in heaven has never lost a battle? Not once. Even though it looked like we lost with Jesus going to the cross, that was a setup because that setback was a setup for a comeback. Amen? Amen? So, so the strategic God that we serve never lost a battle. So I want to share this with you because some, sometimes our relationships are tethered to some of our experiences, especially when it comes to pain, hurt, or disappointment. So just take a moment right now, if you don't mind, I'm going to have you close your eyes again. And I want you to think about what Joseph just went through in this story, where he shares some things that are intimate to him, that God showed him, 
and then he's betrayed. And I want you to think for just a moment. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to bring to your remembrance. Has there been a moment in your life where you've been in relationship with someone and that relationship ended because you felt like you may have been betrayed or hurt or this person didn't follow through on a commitment or an expectation? It could be in your marriage with a parent, a child. It could be with a coworker, a boss, a potential business partner. You were hurt. You found yourself in an emotional pit. Think about that person. Think about that situation. All right, you can open your eyes. So now, when we think through these things, sometimes we get stuck in life, and we don't make it through the entire process so that God can get us to where he's trying to take us. So there's three different types of relationships that I want to bring to your mind so that in the event that there's a season that ends, you will not get stuck any longer. So God brings relationships into our life for a season, for a reason, or for a lifetime. And there's three distinguishing factors on how you can segment those relationships so that if it ends, you are not hurt. Number one, constituents. A constituent is someone that you are in proximity to just because you're in the same environment. For example, if you're in school and you're walking through the hallway because you come to King's Trail and you know, hey man, I'm, I love Christ, I'm gonna be nice to everybody, I'm gonna be a light. You wave, you say hi, you might have a little conversation in the hallway at the lockers. And then you keep it moving, but you would never have them over to your house. You would never go hang out. You would never go play um, or, or ride horses together, whatever. So you like, you keep it moving. You're like, all right, nice to see you. All right, have a great day. That's a constituent. It might be in your workplace. Some of you are constituents even within the church context just due to the fact that you only have so much time to go deep with certain relationships, and that's okay. It's just a fact. Constituents. Number two, comrades. A comrade is someone who has come into your life for one of two reasons. Number one, to fight with you for a common cause or to fight against a common cause together. For example, if you served in the military, by the way, where's all my veterans? Let me see your hands. Let's clap it up for our veterans. Let's give a big round. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. We honor you. Thank you. My dad served 20 years in the Army. Thank you. You fight for our country. And during your time in the service, your comrades. Some of you still have relationships, which is in a different category, but many of you have relationships that have ended as soon as your time in the service ended. That's because you were meant to be in relationship to accomplish that mission, and once the mission was accomplished, the relationship therefore ends. There may be others who are like, hey, we're going to come against, we're going to come against uh, human trafficking. So we're fighting against human trafficking together. Yeah, come on, brother. Come on, come on, come on. And now we're all coming together, and we're in relationship because we're fighting against that thing. And once we accomplish the mission, the relationship ends. If you don't discern the relationship, then your feelings will get hurt when the season ends. Last but not least is a confidant. A confidant is someone who comes into your life for life. Most times, it could be a parent, a spouse, or a long-term best friend. If you can count a confidant on more than one hand, they're probably not a confidant. You just love people. <laughs> Confidants usually you can count on one hand. I can count mine on one hand. This is a person that doesn't care if you're high or low. They are with you no matter where you go. Amen. And all of us need a confidant in our life. All right? So these, type, these three different types of relationships are critical to understand. And once we're able to do that, now we're in position to understand what God has for us in regard to his strategy. So Genesis chapter 37, verse 28. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. So now, when you think about strategy, hmm, we just talked about this. A good idea is not a God idea all the time. And if Joseph had to distinguish which of those relationships his brothers would fit into that I just talked about, which one do you think it would be? Were they constituents, confidants, or comrades, his brothers, even though they're his blood brothers, which, which one would you say? 
constituents, potentially. Keep going. Comrades, right? Why? Because God used them to accomplish a mission in his life. And we're going to get to that. So when we have the discernment, when we're in the pit and we get hurt with this relationship over here, instead of staying mad at this person, we can expand our vision of 50,000 foot view and see, oh, okay, I see the strategy that God is using. That had to come to an end for me to get to where God is taking me. And now your feelings aren't hurt as, more, as much. Does that make sense? You tracking with me, church? Okay, so, so is it possible that God used this idea and this strategy to position Joseph for something much bigger than he ever dreamed? Right? Like he saw the sheaves bowing down and the moon and stars, but is it possible that that thing was even bigger than what he could have ever imagined? Is it possible that in my story when I was flirting with depression and I was down and I wanted to curl up in a ball and stay in the room and not come outside, that guy's like, oh, you want to use the NFL? I got something bigger for you, brother. How about going around the country, around the world? How about that? Like, is it possible that the thing that you are dealing with right now, the pit that you are in, God is like, man, my vision is so much bigger than anything you could have ever imagined, according to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, that it will blow your mind if I showed it to you right now, so I can't even show you the whole thing. Is that a possibility? I can't hear you, church. Is that a possibility? I would agree. So, so this strategy begins to unfold, and now he finds himself in Egypt, the most prosperous, wealthy place on the planet at that time. God's strategy. But then there comes a point when we have to understand that he's going to come over. So turn over to Genesis chapter 39. We're going to start at verse 2. When God begins to execute his strategy, there comes a point where He now hands the ball to us, and it's up to us to operate in the very thing that he called us to do. So we get this vision from God, and it's God's idea, his strategy, but now he gives the ball to us and said, it's up to you to go operate in it. Genesis chapter 39, verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. Everyone say successful. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he do to succeed. Someone say succeed. In his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer of his house, in his house, and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. How many know that God will bless your place of business? Because you showed up. How many of the God will bless the future generations of your family because you are serving God? How many of the God will bless your school because you're there? He'll bless your sports team because you showed up. He'll bless the next rodeo because you came. Huh? Because you showed up and you carry his presence inside of you. It was the Lord's favor. Verse 5. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Who does God want to bless because you showed up? Who needs you to carry and bring his presence so they can transform an atmosphere? Maybe transform a neighborhood, a community, a ministry, a whole city, the state of Texas, y'all. The U.S., how many know we need some help right now? Amen. Maybe even the world, because you showed up. Come on now. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, and after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in this house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is no greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So you think about this. He goes from being betrayed by his very own brothers, his blood. Then he winds up in a pit. 
And now, after Pharaoh's wife tries to sleep with him and he says no, how many know the story? He gets falsely accused and winds up where? In prison. So he goes from the pit to the prison. Spends two years locked up in prison for something he did not do. How many know? Although he was in the prison, he never let the prison inside of him. No matter what your prison is right now, you may be 100% right. You may not have done anything wrong. And you're like, man, I'm stuck in this prison. I'm stuck in this I'm stuck in this pit. I can't understand God. Like, help me break free from this thing. Whatever the enemy is using to try to break you, God will use to be your breakthrough. It was in that moment when he interpreted a dream for the cupbearer. He interpreted a dream for the baker. And they remembered. And Pharaoh has a dream, but no one can interpret it. And then somebody remembers, oh, it was that guy back. Yeah, Joseph, that guy. And they bring him out, they clean him up, they get him shaven, and he comes before Pharaoh. And he says, can you interpret the dream? And he says, God will provide the interpretation. I'm paraphrasing. And he shares the, he shares the vision of the seven plump cows being consumed by the seven skinny cows. And he gives him the interpretation of what's about to happen in the land with seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And then next thing you know, he steps into a place where he says, how can we find such a man to help us through this time? And then God shows up and says, you are the man. So now he gets put in a position where he gets to go back to the original vision that God gave him when he was just a teenager. He gets to revisit the vision. He gets to revisit the kazone. He gets to revisit the thing that God saw since the beginning of time. And he brings him into a place where he can step into the fullness of that. So when you think about this now, he's put in position under what would be considered our governor in modern vernacular. And now, at the age of 30 years old, 13 years has gone by since the vision. From 17 to 30, and he steps into the fullness of it. This was a 13-year cycle for that vision to be fulfilled. And he rules from the age of 30 years old to 110 years old as the second in command to lead the wealthiest nation as a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. How many know that no matter what the enemy tries to bring to your doorstep, God is stronger. God is more powerful. God is in position to help you break through the thing that has tried to break you. So when you think about your life, I want to share this story with you because, again, y'all are an incredible group of believers in this room. And when I was supposed to be here a few months ago, and my wife walks in the house, she says, babe, I think it's time. I just don't have the belly to push. More like, yeah, I got to stop. She's going to get mad if she's watching this. And she's like, I think, and how many know when your wife has had 10 kids, you listen, yeah, yes, ma'am. Because it happens faster and quicker. So, so she's like, hey, I think it's time for us to go. I think I'm about, you know, just super calm. Just like, uh, yes, I think it's time for us to go to the hospital. I'm about to go into labor. Like the opposite of a Hollywood movie. So I'm like, okay, are you sure? She's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm like, okay. So I'm like, all right, let me go get the bag. I run in, I grab the bag. We get the bag in the car. I'm like, all right, baby, I'm going to meet you. We're going to get to the car. But, you know, we, we, this is number 11, so we got 10 kids. It's like herding cats. I'm like, hey, where's your siblings? Where's your siblings? Y'all, come here. We're about to go in labor. Hurry up. Come on, come on. So now everybody's like, oh, okay, 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 okay. And then I'm outside, and my wife's like, babe, I'm, I'm, I'm going to the hospital. I'm like, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming. Okay, I'm going. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, okay. Y'all, hurry up. Mommy's trying to go. And then I get all the kids. I finally got them all. One of the kids running out with her little sister, 
right? She's like one and a half years old, butt naked, just, <laughs> where's the baby's clothes? She's like, oh, she covers her up with a shirt. I'm like, all right, y'all gather around, gather around. She's like, babe, she's like, she's in the car now, right? What are you doing back there? And I'm like, y'all, come on, we got to pray. We, what, you're going to pray? I'm going to the hospital right now. I'm driving myself. <laughs> I'm like, all right, come on, come on. Come on. Jesus' name, amen. Got to go. <laughs> so we hop in the car. And man, I got that thing in the navigation. I'm prepared, ready to go. We got the backpack. Like, I feel like, yeah, I did all my, you know, did all my responsibilities as a good husband, good father. Like, yeah, we're going to be good. This route is 20 minutes to the hospital. Okay, it's in the navy. We're rolling. Five minutes in, boom, she got the seat all the way back. Oh, oh, babe, what, how long is it going to be till we get there? We're five minutes into the ride. I'm like, babe, we got 15 more minutes. She said, we're not going to make it. She grabs my arm and like claw marks, like right here. I still got some scars right there. <laughs> I'm like, what do you want to do? She's like, babe, you need to call this hospital. Call them first. Make sure they have labor and delivery. I'm like, okay. And now, mind you, I'm driving, okay? I'm mind you. I got three of my daughters in the back. I'm like, okay, I'm going to drive in. And then she's like, call them right now. Make sure they got them. I'm like, okay. Then she's like, you need to go faster. I'm like, okay. Arr. She put the hazard lights on. Yes, ma'am. On the phone. Go through that stoplight. I'm like, oh, my God. Arr. We get through the stoplight, answer the phone. I look at the Navi. I'm like, hey, we're going to be there in about three minutes. Y'all have labor and delivery? Yes, we have labor and delivery. I'm like, okay, I'll be there in three minutes. My wife's in labor right now. Pow! I look over, and I think one of the tires has popped. And all I see is mist everywhere. I'm like, what is that? She says, what do you think it is? My, my water broke. <laughs> True story. My, I'm not embellishing by any means. Literally, I thought, a balloon, I thought a balloon popped. Never happened. Ten kids. <laughs> Pull up to the ER. Boom, boom, boom. Guy behind the thing, he's on his AirPods, right? Hey, my wife is in labor right now. I need help. I, I just called three minutes ago. They said somebody be here from, e, uh, from, from the ER to be here. Oh, sir, it's okay. Just relax. It's going to be fine. <laughs> Are you kidding me, bro? Get another job. I went outside. I go to check on my wife. Boom. I look. You okay, baby? Head is crowning. In the car. I'm like, oh, my God. She's like, babe, the baby's coming right now. That football kicked in. I looked. I was like, <laughs> tempted to do this. Thought about it. Blue 42. <laughs> Blue 42. Set. It was just a thought. I didn't want to die right before my daughter was born. So I was not a good idea. A good filter. I'm pushing. Boom. Head comes out. I'm like, I got you, babe. Give me one, one more push. She pushes again, turn the baby, pull the baby out. Look, it's a girl. Patting my baby girl. I'm like, oh, man, welcome to this world. If y'all don't believe me, I'm not embellishing this story at all. You can look it up, look it up on, online. I literally, we literally posted it. My, my, my daughters were video on the whole thing. <laughs> I promise you, you can find it on Facebook. Look it up. And man, in that moment, I was so overwhelmed with joy. And I'm holding this beautiful baby girl. And if you've ever hugged me, you know. Carrie knows. I get some really good bear hugs. I've been known to crack a rib or two. And I was like, man, I don't want my baby girl to experience that just coming out of <laughs> And so I'm, I'm, I'm gently rubbing her, but how many of y'all know when a baby's first born, there's something really important that's got to happen with the baby. What is that? You got to hear the cry, and there's no cry. And all I see is, she's trying to do that. Precious, beautiful sound of a baby, and nothing's coming out. So in that moment, I'm feeling like, oh my God, what is about to happen? The baby's turning blue. Is she going to be okay? And as soon as I'm about to panic, as soon as I feel like the enemy's about to come and attack my mind and my heart and this beautiful new gift, all I hear is, sir, sir, can we help? Can we help? I look over my shoulders, eight to 10 doctors and nurses standing right there. Yes, please. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Boom. She comes in, does the little suction cup, pulls all that mucus out of the baby's mouth, and all I hear is, <laughs> Beautiful sound. There she is. Thank you. 
That's her, Liani Nashama Davis. It literally means the inspiration. Amen. And she inspired us all the way she came. Why do I share that story with you? The reason why is because we had, not, we, had, we had a vision. Yeah, man, God has blessed us, and we're grateful to have number 11. We had an idea how we thought the delivery was going to happen. Right? <laughs> and we actually had a strategy, but God had a different strategy. Because she wasn't due for another week. That's why I agreed to come and preach. But I said, she might come early. And then we had to go and execute. And when my wife was giving me 9,000 instructions all at once, I had, to, I had to get it done. I had to follow through. And now we're sitting in the hospital. My wife is asleep. The baby is asleep. She was born Saturday, June 29th, 7.01 p.m., 18 inches long, 7 pounds, sleeping just as peaceful. And, man, I'm just looking at my wife. I'm looking at the baby, looking at my wife, looking at the baby, just in awe of what God just did. As I thought about all the ways that thing could have went south. We got any medical professionals in here? Okay, we got a couple of you. Like, think about this. We were 20 minutes out. What would have happened if I hadn't listened? What would have happened if I kept, oh, we'll be fine, just go to this hospital? We'd have been having that baby on the side of the road somewhere. Who knows how long it would have taken for an ambulance to arrive? Now how long did the baby go without oxygen? Is she still alive? There's a million ways that thing could have went south. But I'm sitting there. And I'm looking at the miracle of what God just did. And then the Holy Spirit speaks to me. And he's like, son, look at this doctor that just came in just as jolly and happy. Look at, this, look at this nurse that just came in. Do you know how many years they spent studying just to be here for this moment? Look at this building that has been built to facilitate such a process so that a child could be born. Think about the baby shower that took place. Think about all the prayers. Think about everything that happened for this baby to be born successfully, according to my will. And I was just overwhelmed with emotion and joy. And then, you know, God, he's, I like to call him sometimes Jehovah Sneaky. Because <laughs> he just always got a way, right, of just getting you that download, that revelation to understand what he's called you to do and show you it in a way that you never thought to see it. And he said, now, you see everything that took place before your daughter was born and all the preparation that took place for your daughter to be born. Now I want you to imagine everything that had to take place for you to be reborn. Think about the fact that I had a cozone. I had a vision for you since the beginning of time. Since before you were ever born, before you ever thought about, I had a plan and a purpose for you, according to Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts and the plans that I have towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope and expect it in. The prophets, the Bible being written, the prophetic words that I've given you, the millions of sperm that were competing to fertilize the egg, but you did it. Now, my son, my daughter, can you trust and believe that I have success for you, which looks like you doing the very thing that I put you on the earth to do, to be a reflection of my goodness to the world, to be a light in a dark place, to be a city set on a hill, to be a lighthouse so that those who are lost can find me, to be my billboard. Man, it hit me like a ton of bricks in that moment. God is no respecter of person, and that is the plan that he has for us all. So as you think about this, I'm going to move this, I'm going to move this whiteboard over here, and I'm going to give you an opportunity in just a moment, because I believe God really wants to do something. He spoke to me in worship. And I've asked the worship team, thank you, Pastor Shane, for coming back up. I asked them to prepare to come up because in a moment you're going to get a chance to respond. So I'm going to ask you to do two things. Number one, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes in just a moment. And I'm going to to have you think of the vision that God has for you. But then there's, there's a pit, there's a pit that many of you have been stuck in. And you thought God had deserted you. But he, but he hasn't. 
He's actually in the pit with you. He loves you. He hasn't gone anywhere. And then some of you have gotten out of the pit, but now you find yourself in a prison. Whatever that proverbial prison represents, you're just like, man, I don't deserve to be here. I thought I'd be further along. Like, I can't believe I'm stuck in this situation. What, God, where are you? Or there's someone that you need to forgive. It could be a parent, an ex-spouse, a child, a former boss, a business partner. Somebody in your life needs for you to forgive them. So I'm priming the pump right now because I want you to, I want you to get prepared because in just a moment, you're going to have an opportunity to bring that person's face to your, to your mind. And then I'm going to share one last illustration of how this Vajra cycle shows up with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and how he successfully went through the process so that we can be where we are today. So I'd like for you to just close your eyes and I want you to think about the pain of your life, the disappointment, the times when you felt as if God should have come through for you, but from your perspective, he didn't. The relationship that ended counterintuitively from what you expected. The fact that you've done everything humanly possible to make that thing right and you still find yourself at a loss. Picture the face or faces of those who hurt you. Because to successfully go through this cycle, to get to the top of that mountain, to get to the precipice of your purpose, forgiveness is not optional. So as you picture their faces, as you think of the name, I want to ask you to consider, would you be willing to consider forgiving them? See, Joseph had that moment when God brought his whole family back to him, and he was in a position of power where he could have put his thumb on them. But Joseph chose to forgive them, and I believe that's the reason why God trusted him with the vision that he showed him for so many years. So would you be willing in this moment to forgive those who have hurt you? Just as a, an act of faith, I want you to just raise your hand if that's you. Everybody else, keep your eyes closed. Just raise your hands if you're, if you're forgiving right now. Go ahead. I see your hands. Yeah, don't be afraid. It's okay. This is a moment of healing for you. Yeah, you can put your hands down. Thank you. So I'm going to say this prayer. And then... I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to what God is doing in your heart. And if you need healing, you know that God has something bigger, something greater, something more magnificent that he wants to do in you, but you felt stuck. Could it be so that this is the reason? So as an act of faith, when I say amen, if that's you, I want you to get out of your seat and I want you to come up here and the worship team is going to start to play. And I want you to receive that healing from the Lord. And if you're not willing, I will give you this to consider. Could it be so that drinking poison is synonymous with unforgiveness in your heart, but you're expecting the other person to die? Drinking poison, hoping the other person dies, is what unforgiveness is in the human heart. So if you want to receive healing, you want the Lord to minister to you, I'm going to have our worship team play right now, and I want you to make your way up here. And bow before your king so he can heal your heart. Let's worship. Father, I thank you so much for my brothers, my sisters. I thank you for the courage to say, heal my broken heart. I thank you for the purposes, the plans that you have for every person under the sound of my voice. And Lord, I pray that any and every roadblock, any and every pit, any and every prison that we find ourselves in will be demolished and desecrated right now. And I thank you for the courage to step into a place of true healing and freedom.
no matter where you find yourself right now. I want you to think about this. Jesus himself went through this process. When God, imagine him in heaven, had a vision to redeem mankind. And he had an idea, I'm going to send my son The strategy was allow him to live for 33 and a half years. And Jesus had to take the reins and say, I'm willing, although I'm the lion, to become the lamb. I am willing, although I am 100% God, to be 100% man. And I'm willing to go to the cross and I'm willing to lay down my life so that you and I could live. 
And after he took his last breath and submitted his spirit, he said, now it's time for you, Matthew 28, 19, to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them the commands that I have taught you so that the world would have an opportunity to come to know the Father that created them. How many know forgiveness is not optional for the believer? So I want you to know, my brothers and my sisters, that although your perspective may still not have the cognitive ability to understand, change it. Imagine looking at that mountaintop that we had you look at at the beginning of service with your eyes closed. But instead of looking at that mountaintop from you standing on the ground or even being on the top of the mountain, I want you to zoom up and see it from God's perspective. Imagine his arm around you and you looking down at that mountain from a topographical view. See, you've been going around what feels like a wilderness, just like the Israelites, going through this process. And God is looking at you like, keep on going, baby, because I got something for you. And the more you do it, the higher you go. And guess what? You're going to wind up hitting right at the peak of exactly what I created you to do. You are going to hit the bullseye. And church, I'm here today to tell you, no matter where you find yourself in your process, God has gone before you, he's behind you, and he is with you right now. You cannot fail. So as you look at this cycle, just remember that this is an open book test, and you cannot fail unless you quit. Are you ready to succeed in doing what God has called you to do? One, two, three. Jesus! God bless you and thank you as you go.